So let's talk about how the GBU-57 bunker buster, which the US might deploy against Iran, works. We are going to talk about the physics behind it, the material science, penetration geometry, how it knows when to detonate, and why it can only be delivered by the B-2 bomber. And also why the US might have to hit the same location or crater more than once, or at least three times, for significant damage. First of all, the term bunker buster describes any munition designed to penetrate protective layers of earth and concrete before detonating its warhead. A common misconception is that these weapons function primarily through the force of a massive explosive charge. While the explosive payload is critical for destroying the target once reached, the defining characteristic of a bunker buster is its ability to deliver that payload to the correct subterranean location. This is achieved by weaponizing a fundamental principle of physics, which is kinetic energy. The main concept involves converting the immense potential energy a bomb possesses at high altitude into kinetic energy as it accelerates towards the ground. Upon impact, this energy is focused on a small point, allowing the bomb to displace, fracture, and burrow through hardened materials. The majority of the weapon's mass is therefore dedicated to an exceptionally strong, dense, and heavy penetrator casing designed to survive the colossal stresses of impact and function more like a drill or a massive steel dart than a conventional bomb. So, the ability of a bunker buster to pierce through meters of rock and reinforced concrete is a well-calculated and sophisticated application of physics and material science. The design of these weapons is a complex optimization problem, balancing mass, velocity, material strength, and geometry to transform a falling object into an unstoppable subterranean projectile. The fundamental driver of penetration is the kinetic energy of the weapon upon impact. This energy must be sufficient to overcome the resistance of the target material, causing it to fracture and be displaced. The governing equation is kinetic energy equals to a half mass times velocity squared, where m is the mass of the projectile and v is its velocity. This simple formula reveals two critical levers for weapon designers and highlights that velocity has an exponentially greater impact on energy than mass. The most straightforward way to increase a bomb's kinetic energy is to increase its mass. A heavier object, traveling at the same speed, carries more energy and momentum, allowing it to push through more material before coming to rest. This principle explains the clear evolutionary path in U.S. penetrator design, from the 2,000-pound class EELU-109 to the 5,000-pound GBU-28, and leading to the 30,000-pound GBU-57 Massive Ordnance Penetrator, or MOP. Each step up in weight class represents an increase in penetration capability. Because kinetic energy scales with the square of velocity, speed is an even more important factor. Bunker busters achieve exceptionally high terminal velocities, primarily through gravity, by being released from extremely high altitudes. A delivery platform like the B-2 Spirit, which can release its payload from altitudes of up to 50,000 feet, allows the bomb a long, unimpeded fall to accelerate to supersonic speeds, often exceeding Mach 1. The choice of launch platform is therefore critical. A MOP released from a B-2, flying at 50,000 feet and 500 miles per hour, will impact with way more kinetic energy than the same weapon dropped from a C-130 at 25,000 feet and 250 miles per hour. But a penetrator's kinetic energy is useless if the weapon shatters on impact, which brings us to the material science, the casing or penetrator body, must be engineered to withstand the immense deceleration forces and material stresses, which can be millions of pounds per square inch as it smashes into its target. The original GBU-28 famously used casings fashioned from the barrels of decommissioned M110 howitzers as artillery pieces are made from exceptionally strong, forged, and hardened steel designed to contain repeated explosive blasts. Modern penetrators have evolved to use purpose-built casings machined from a single, solid billet 
of proprietary high-strength steel alloys, such as Iglin steel, to eliminate welds or other potential points of failure. The Air Force Research Laboratory has continued to innovate in this field, developing new alloys like AF-96, which improves performance while reducing manufacturing costs and eliminating reliance on expensive or politically sensitive conflict minerals. For maximum penetration, designers seek materials that combine hardness with extreme density. While not officially confirmed to be used in the GBU-57, depleted uranium is often cited as a near-ideal material for penetrator applications due to its unique combination of properties. One of them is the unique extreme density, because DU is approximately 2.4 times denser than steel, allowing a projectile of the same size to have significantly more mass, and therefore more kinetic energy and momentum. Another one is hardness, because DU, or depleted uranium, is an extremely hard metal, with a Brunel hardness value approaching that of tungsten, which allows it to resist deformation and shattering upon impact with concrete or rock. A third one, incendiary properties. So DU is pyrophoric, meaning it ignites suddenly when it fractures and is exposed to air at high temperatures. An impact by a DU penetrator would breach the target and fill the interior space with an intensely hot, burning metal, adding a powerful flammable effect to the subsequent warhead detonation. When it comes to the geometry, the shape of the penetrator is as important as its mass and material composition. To be effective, the weapon's immense kinetic energy must be concentrated onto the smallest possible area to maximize pressure and overcome the target's material strength. So it has three important sections, the nose, section density, and the sum fins for spin stabilization. So when it comes to the nose shape, the bunker busters feature a narrow pointed nose, typically in a conical or more complex agival shape. This geometry functions like the point of a nail or a dart, focusing the entire impact force to initiate the breach. The design of the nose is a careful engineering trade-off. If it is too sharp, the tip may fracture on impact, but if it is too blunt, it will be inefficient at piercing the target surface. Then for the sectional density, this is a critical parameter defined as the weapon's mass divided by its cross-sectional area. A high sectional density is the defining characteristic of an effective penetrator. By packing a great deal of mass into a long, narrow body, the weapon has to displace less material, like earth or concrete, as it burrows forward, allowing it to penetrate deeper. This is why all bunker busters, from the GBU-28 to the GBU-57, share the distinctive physical profile of a long, heavy steel dart. Then for the spin stabilization, in order to ensure the weapon strikes the target at the optimal angle and maintains a stable trajectory during its long fall, many designs incorporate offset fins on the tail assembly. As air rushes past, these fins induce a rotation causing the bomb to spin along its longitudinal axis. This gyroscopic effect provides stability, much like a spinning top or a rifle bullet, making the weapon resistant to being deflected by crosswinds or atmospheric variations and improving its accuracy. The ultimate goal of a bunker buster is to detonate its warhead deep within the ground, as close to the buried target as possible. When a bomb detonates at or above the surface, a large portion of its blast energy is reflected off the ground and radiates upward and outward into the atmosphere, where it quickly dissipates. In an underground explosion, the surrounding earth or rock contains the initial blast, coupling the energy and channeling it directly into the ground. This creates an intense seismic shock wave that propagates through the dense medium with much greater efficiency. Even detonating just a few meters below the surface can increase the destructive effect on a buried target by a factor of 20 or more compared to a surface burst. This effect is often described as creating a localized, man-made earthquake, generating immense pressure that can crush concrete walls, collapse tunnels, and pulverize sensitive equipment within the target facility. The brains of a modern bunker buster 
is the advanced programmable electronic fuses that can adapt to the environment they encounter during penetration. These smart fuses transform the weapon from a blunt instrument into a diagnostic tool, allowing it to determine the optimal point of detonation on its own. Several key technologies enable this capability, like layer counting, void sensing, and large penetrator smart fuse. Because of the sheer scale of the GBU-57 dictates its delivery options. At 30,000 pounds and over 20 feet long, the MRP is far too large and heavy to be carried on the external hard points or within the standard internal bays of tactical aircraft like the F-15 or F-35. It can only be operationally carried and deployed by the B-2 Spirit. The B-2 was designed with two expansive internal rotary launcher assemblies in side-by-side -side weapons bays. These bays are large enough to accommodate the MOP, and the aircraft is rated to carry one in each bay for a total payload of two MOPs per sortie. The US Air Force has successfully tested the B-2 with this 60,000-pound loadout, confirming its ability to deliver a one-two punch against a single target in one pass. But the thing is, Despite its formidable power, a single GBU-57 MOP has physical limits, and I'm about to explain why they need multiple strikes at a single crater. As of now, the publicly stated penetration capability of up to 200 feet or 61 meters is crazy, but some of the world's most fortified, hardened, and deep-buried targets are designed to exceed this threshold. Iran's Fordo facility, for example, is believed to be buried 80 to 90 meters, or 260 to 300 feet, beneath a mountain, placing its critical chambers beyond the reach of a single MOP strike. And also, the effectiveness of penetration is highly dependent on the composition of the protective layers, and the 200-foot figure by the US is an optimistic benchmark, likely for soil or standard-strength rock, but no one knows for sure. As such, enemies are employing advanced construction materials like ultra-high-performance concrete, which can be several times stronger than standard reinforced concrete. Against such materials, the Moppy's penetration depth could be drastically reduced, potentially to as little as 30 feet. Faced with a target buried under hundreds of feet of granite and reinforced with layers of UHPC, a single bomb, no matter how powerful, is unlikely to succeed. To solve this problem, military planners have developed a tactic variously described as burrowing, drilling, or sequential impacting. This doctrine involves using multiple bombs in rapid succession, with each one aimed at the exact same impact point. The mechanism is straightforward in concept, but highly complex in execution. The first MOP is dropped and impacts the target area. It penetrates as far as its energy allows and detonates, creating a deep crater and shattering the rock and concrete below it. A second MOP, dropped by the same B-2 on a subsequent pass, or by a second bomber in formation, is guided to the precise coordinates of the first impact. This second bomb does not have to penetrate the surface. It enters the pre-existing drill hole created by the first bomb. It travels through the already fractured overburden and uses its kinetic energy to penetrate further into the undisturbed material below before detonating. This process can be repeated with a third, fourth, or as many bombs as are deemed necessary, with each successive blast deepening and extending the shaft until the desired target depth is reached. This tactic effectively allows the cumulative effect of multiple munitions to achieve a depth of penetration that is impossible for any single bomb. It is a tactical adaptation designed to overcome the extreme defensive engineering of an adversary's most vital sanctuaries. This precision is non-negotiable. If the second bomb were to miss the crater created by the first by even a few meters, it would strike undisturbed ground and the drilling effect would be lost. Instead of one very deep shaft, the result would be several adjacent shallow craters leaving the deeply buried target unharmed. Therefore, the multiple-hit doctrine represents a fusion of two distinct technologies. 
the raw, penetrating power of the MOP's mass and hardened case, and the pinpoint accuracy of its digital guidance brain. And in all this, remember, an adversary nation will not passively await an attack on its most valuable assets. It will deploy a layered defense designed to disrupt or defeat the strike at every stage. Also, remember the GBU-57 has never been used in combat. Its role is primarily one of strategic deterrence, to hold an adversary's most protected assets at risk and thereby influence their strategic calculus, so no one knows for sure if this will be possible or not.